Hi, hello, and welcome to Rebel Unicorn Crafts. Today, I wanna to talk about different watercolor surfaces because I get a ton of questions on what is the best paper or thing to paint on with watercolor. So I gathered up a bunch of different papers and surfaces from around my studio, including even just some cardstock and printer paper because I get questions on if you can paint on those as well. These papers are going to differ in what they're made of, how thick they are, how textured they are, and then the surfaces are obviously going to be a little different since they're not paper. Paper. In order to test this, I have mixed up three colors and enough of that in order to go across all of the different surfaces so that we can actually kind of compare them all the same across. And then of course I spilled them. So let's clean that up before we get started. I always hesitate to tell people what to actually paint on because that's gonna depend on a lot of different things. So my tests today are going to be targeted at answering some of those questions based on what you might like. Part of that is gonna be price. I will go over all the different prices at the very end. Part of it is going to be the blending of colors on the page. So that's what I'm testing when it goes from yellow to blue. If you're like me, you like to encourage blooms in your work. And so that is a really key thing for me in what I like to paint on. That's what I'm doing in that red circle. So I paint it, let it soak in a little bit, and then I just drop some water into it. And that pushes the pigment away. And on certain papers, it's going to create this really interesting texture and also kind of a highlight area. Similar to that is dropping in color. So you can put one color down and then drop in another color. And I wanna see how that bleeds together, how much it pushes, how much you can actually see the two different colors and just kind of what it looks like. Then with this big blue box, I'm gonna be testing a couple things. The first thing is how many back runs. So those unintentional areas where it didn't dry quite evenly and it kind of runs back and has that uneven finish or look to it which again is kind of related to the bloom, so they look nice and neat, but a lot of times you want to avoid that. So that's part of what I'm testing with that blue box, but the other thing I'm testing with that is also I'm gonna let it dry and I'm going to layer on top of it because sometimes you wanna do a lot of layering and certain papers are better for that. The final thing I wanna test here is how well does it lift? Now there's a ton of different ways to lift watercolor. The method I'm gonna be using is the kind of damp, cleaned off, dried-ish brush method. And so what I'm gonna do is after I paint the strip, I'm gonna wash my brush, tap it off so that it's pretty much dry. I'm gonna swipe once, tap it again, and swipe a second time. I think on one of these tests, I accidentally swiped three times on one of them. But in general, I wanna keep it kind of consistent across all of these different mediums. So that's the way I'm gonna be swiping to actually take off and lift that color up so we can see which ones lift better. The first one I tested on was Strathmore 140 pound cold pressed paper, and you saw it in slow time, but I'm testing a bunch of different surfaces and a bunch of different papers. So for the rest of these, I'm actually going to speed this up so we can see it a little bit faster, and I'll touch on a few highlights as we go. Next up is the Canson XL 140 pound cold press paper. This one has about the same level of texture as the Strathmore one, and this is one of my go-to papers. Part of that is because it's a budget-friendly option, and it's also widely available, but there are a couple other reasons why I really like this paper, and you can notice a couple of those things. Notice how I mentioned I really like those blooms, and you can already see this one does have some more spectacular blooms, and even when you drop in colors, the color isn't necessarily as vibrant when you drop it in, but it has this really spectacular push that I just personally like. So those are a couple reasons. And not only that, but it lifts really, really well. So it's really forgiving for making mistakes. So that's another reason why I personally like this one. Now, next up, we're going to test a slightly thinner paper or less weighted paper. This one is Creatology's 90 pound sketch pad. And this is like what I would personally consider to be the bare minimum weight for doing anything with watercolor, including just playing around because that paper is going to warp a ton and they just don't quite function as well as other papers. But you can see here that it performs fairly well. It's got pretty good lifting. It also has some nice blending and some good blooms going on. This isn't something I would make necessarily a super finished product with because it would be really warped, but it is a pretty decent sketchbook type paper. Then after that, let's do the level one artist loft. So this is what's available from Michaels as their baseline 140 pound watercolor paper. 
This one says it's cold pressed, and I mean, I believe them, that's what they say, but it is a lot smoother than any of the other ones. It's even a little smoother than that Createology. I do use this paper quite often because it's also really budget friendly. I love the way things blend together on it. And in some ways it feels a little more forgiving for some things, but I do often miss that texture of truly cold pressed paper for some things. For other things, I love it. After that, let's test something that is on the opposite side of texture. This is actually Arch's rough 140 pound paper, and so it has a lot of texture. I really like the texture on this paper. Now, Arch's is kind of the gold standard that most people use for watercolor paper, so you've probably heard of it, but it is super duper pricey. Now, part of the reason why it's super pricey is because it's a 100% cotton paper. Some of those other ones are kind of cellulose based, so that gives them some different properties. And this is what most artists will kind of reach for and really choose to paint with. But because of that price range, I personally find, especially when you're learning, it's kind of an intimidating paper to work on. Now, it does seem to have the best vibrancy of all the papers. It really grabs that color and just holds onto it, and it's super duper vibrant. It also is a slower dry time, so you have more working time, but that can also kind of hinder you in some ways. Because for things like blooms, you actually need to be able to kind of do that in the in-between time. And because it dries so slow, you have this really elongated time where that might work or might not work. And in general, I've just found the blooms don't work quite as well on this paper because it really absorbs that water and keeps it there. The next one is the most kind of unconventional of all the things I'm testing, and this is Daniel Smith's Watercolor Ground. There are a couple other brands that do this as well, but it is basically a paste-like substance that you can paint onto anything, and then you let it dry, and once it's dry, you can paint on it, and you'll get watercolor-like effects similar to what you'd have on paper. There are definitely some downfalls because it's not exactly like paper, so you don't get um, as much of the vibrancy. You can load more and more color onto this, but it takes a lot longer to get the same level of vibrancy. And it's nearly impossible to get effects like blooms and things like that on this. But it really can't beat the fact that you could paint it on a basketball and then have a watercolor basketball. Another untraditional surface is this aqua board. So they used to be called clay boards because it's coated in some sort of a clay type surface that's going to act kind of similar to paper where it will soak in and actually allow some of that color to move around. It's on an MDF board, so it's super hard, which will make this really easy to frame because as long as you get a size of this aqua board that you can just slap into a frame, you won't need to really do anything else. And because it's nice and hard, it obviously is not going to warp at all. Now, again, it's kind of similar to the Daniel Smith where it takes longer to build up that vibrancy of color. So you have some unique challenges there. For my final two tests that I want to do, I am going to bring in that cardstock as well as just some plain old printer paper, which we'll see in a minute, because I get questions on why isn't something working and whatnot, and then somebody might mention that they're using something like cardstock, and you can technically paint watercolor on anything. It just might not stay and uh, it might have some kind of unintended strange effects. Notice here how much this instantly starts to kind of bubble up. The vibrancy is lacking, you don't get some of those effects, and on the cardstock paper, it had this one really strange unintended effect where there must have been like little globs of certain types of material on that paper that got a lot darker and it kind of made it speckled, which could be kind of cool, but it would also, it didn't happen right away, so it was a little surprising and not something I would have expected. It's also super duper smooth, so you're not gonna get kind of any of that interesting texture. It's really not made for this purpose, so we can't expect too much from it. So, I mean, if this is all you have on hand, that's totally fine, but it's not something that I would go out and purchase for this activity specifically. And then the good old printer paper. Again, yes, you could technically paint on this, but it's going to go almost instantly through to the other side, making your work surface underneath messy as well. It's going to warp a ton. The colors aren't going to be vibrant. And if you even press too hard, once everything is wet, you could poke your brush right through this. So this is probably not a great thing, even for something like kids, you'd probably at least want to give them that cardstock. So they're not going to completely poke all the way through or something like that. 
I will say a ream of paper is kind of pricey in all reality, and one of those 90 pound watercolor pads are actually sometimes around three or four dollars, so they're not too expensive. I mentioned at the beginning that part of that big blue box, I actually also wanted to test layering, so I let these all dry around the same amount of time, what I'm typically used to for just letting things dry and moving on with my normal papers, and I'm just going to layer on a couple different colors. What I'm looking for here are nice clear lines along the edges. And I don't want the colors to bleed together or kind of lift up as I place them down because ideally they will be dry. Most of these work pretty well. I will say arches typically has a leg up on this. I have found that I can layer more and more and more on arches and it's more forgiving than when you start to layer on other papers. And when you get really dark and you continue to layer, it can start to lift some of the layers underneath up because you've got so much paint kind of sitting on the top layer. And arches does seem to kind of grab it and sink it so that it doesn't become easily accessible to your brush. A couple things to note here are that that Daniel Smith and that watercolor ground were not dry enough to actually move on. I did have to grab the hairdryer in order to try, and I have noticed this. If you do a layer with that Daniel Smith, you pretty much, unless you really sit there with that hairdryer, you're gonna need to sit there or even just let it sit overnight before you can do another layer. The aqua board takes longer to dry, but the hairdryer trick does work about as well as paper. It's just a little slower. Here they are all once they were dried. You can see them all kind of next to each other and you're gonna start to see some differences. I want you to notice a couple things. Notice the vibrancy of the colors. Notice how much there is an outline around where you place your colors, the blooms, how many backgrounds there were, as well as how much was actually lifted off the paper when we did our lifting exercise. Again, that one strange kind of unexplainable thing with the cardstock paper, even once it dried, it still retained that speckled look, so that really surprised me. Another thing you can notice is how warped any of these papers are. You're going to really see on that printer paper how warped it is, even just from sitting there. When we bring some of these next to each other, you can see that the arches had a bunch of vibrancy. Something like the Strathmore also retained quite a bit of vibrancy, but the printer paper, it looks like a completely different color. It's a similar story with something like the watercolor ground, but what I actually want you to notice there is how much things just kind of blend smoothly together. This could be used for really good effects if you like that blending smooth, but you're not gonna get any of that bleeding or any blooming or any really interesting textures. Everything's gonna be definitely smoothed out with that watercolor ground. So what's the best? As usual, I am not officially going to say which one is the best, but what I do wanna do is go through some of the top ones and discuss their pros and cons. For the Arches paper, this is a $20 pad of paper, even this little tiny one that I have here. So it is a high price point. That's definitely one of its cons, but it really can't be beat for how vibrant the colors are, how nice the layering is, and the paper has a beautiful texture to it. Now it does have some drawbacks. You don't get great blooms on it. It has a much slower dry time and the lifting isn't ideal. Now in a non-test environment, when you do lift a little bit more, you can get closer, but it's just not as easy to lift as some of the other surfaces. Aquaboard, one of the big pros is it doesn't warp because it's a nice hard surface. There are super fun blooms on it, decent lifting, and it's super easy to frame and looks really professional and polished but it does have a much longer dry time. The colors are not as saturated and you're going to have a higher price point because you're gonna to have to buy each board and depending on the size, they start around two to three dollars a single board and go up from there. Artist Loft is a nice budget-friendly option because it's about six or seven dollars for a pack of 24 pages of the nine by 12 size. And this one is going to give you really nice blooms, great color blending and decent lifting but there are a couple downfalls just like any of these other ones. It does lend itself to kind of harsh outlines on any of your brush strokes or spaces. It's really easy to get unintentional back runs and that paper is super smooth. So if you prefer more textured paper, this one's probably not it. The Canton XL, as I mentioned, this was one of my first ones, so I'm probably a little biased towards it, 
And again, this one is a budget-friendly one. Currently, I'm seeing it going for about $10 a pack, but I've also seen it go for around $7. And I love this one because it's got really nice blooms. It dries pretty fast. The lifting is unbeatable on this one. The one big downfall with this one that I personally have is that it's easy to get those unintentional back runs and a bunch of layering on top of it isn't necessarily the best. But what about the Daniel Smith watercolor ground? The big pro on this is that it can be used on unconventional surfaces, so things that you normally can't paint watercolor on, voila, now you can. Only problem is you do get a loss of vibrancy, there really aren't any blooms, it's hard to lift, and there's a really long dry time. But again, you can paint on anything. And the Creatology one, for a pack of this, it's only about $4, and if you had one of those Michaels coupons, it's probably going to be even less. So obviously the pros are it's budget friendly, because it's thinner, that means that it dries faster, so if you're impatient, this might be great. It's got good blooms, pretty easy lifting. Only problem is you are going to get a little loss of vibrancy. You're going to get a ton of warping because it's a much thinner paper. There are some unintentional back runs. And then outside of this test, I have observed that when you pull the tape off of this one, it does rip a little easier. So as with most things in life, there isn't necessarily one specific answer on what is the best here. It's really going to depend on your personal needs, your budget restrictions, as well as what you like to do and how much you paint. Pretty much any of the papers here, if you are a prolific painter, are going to be great, except for that arches. Unless you've got the budget for it, then hey, go for it. Personally, for my day-to-day -day use, I use Canson XL's paper, and I use quite a bit of different artist loft paper as well because I just find it really useful. It's nice and fits into the budget for all the different testing things I do, and it's great to fill sketchbooks. And then when I'm feeling fancy, I will pull out one of those unconventional surfaces or my arches paper. I hope this was at least somewhat helpful, and if you did find it helpful, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel, and I hope that you have a magically creative day.